You are listening to The Pulse, Rod Murray's e-learning tech podcast. COVID Converted Edition number four, interview with Sion Bylock. Maybe I'm amazed at the way you love me all the time. Maybe I'm afraid of the way I love you. Maybe I'm amazed. Hi, this is Rod. Welcome back. So how do you like that? Maybe I'm Amazed. That's by Blake Morgan. Now, I certainly thought it was Paul McCartney. I thought somebody did a, some sort of a mashup, but that's Blake Morgan. Stay tuned. I think it's a great song, and I play it in full at the end of my podcast. Hi, this is Blake Morgan, and you're listening to Rod's Pulse Podcast. Today's podcast episode is sponsored by D2L. You may know their main product, the Brightspace Learning Management System, I, of course, would only accept sponsorship from companies and products that I am very fond of. So please check out their website at d2l.com slash Pulse Podcast to learn more. In the interest of full disclosure, my institution, the University of the Sciences, uses D2L Brightspace. I also invite you to follow me on Twitter. My handle is Rods Pods. As always, I post links to the things we talk about on my show notes website at www.rodspulsepodcast.com. This special COVID Converted Edition audio and video podcast series is a response to the impact of COVID-19 on the way we live, learn, and work. Today's interview is with Dr. Sian Bylock, president of Barnard College. Learn how one college is helping young people combat fear and anxiety through mandatory coursework designed to provide context to the big problems we're facing during this pandemic. We discuss Dr. Bylock's background, how they move to compressed semesters, asynchronous versus synchronous teaching, and a new required course, Big Problems 2020, and how faculty make meaning out of the current environment. They enabled alumni circles that help students. We talk about Zoom fatigue, how they added student Zoom preceptors to help faculty with their Zoom classes. They institute a health and fitness program called Feel Well, Do Well, and one of the more clever things that they added was something called the Student Tutor Corps, and that was designed to hire students to take demand off of faculty and staff working from home. Their students help to keep their children engaged and give some time off to the faculty and staff. And we end up talking a little bit about how education will change after the pandemic. So without further ado, here's my interview with Dr. Bylock. So, Dr. Bylock, thank you so much for joining my podcast audience today. I really been looking forward to uh, hearing from you and and what your school is going through. Um, so, uh, welcome. And uh, how are you doing up there in New York, or if you're living <laughs> in New York even these days? Yeah, I'm on campus right now in my office, um, and you know we're doing okay. I think this has been an unprecedented year and an unprecedented time, but. Um, we're adapting and moving forward. And I think that's all you can ask for right now. That's right. Um, I've, uh, my audience may not know much about you. I wonder if you could just give us a little bit of uh, your history and how you ended up at uh, Barnard College. Yeah, so I am a cognitive scientist by training, um, which means that I'm really interested in what happens in the brain and body in terms of um, supporting our performance and everything from hitting a golf ball to public speaking to taking a test. Um, And I spent my career as a faculty member um, at the University of Chicago uh, and where I also um, stepped into administration as executive vice provost and um, I spent my career as a researcher studying why we choke under pressure. So why we sometimes fail to perform up to our potential and what we can do about it. Um, And I'm now in my fourth year at Barnard College, which is um, one of the most amazing institutions in the country and the world. It's devoted to women's intellectual leadership and it's a small college uh, focused across the arts and sciences, um, but with Uh, the umbrella of Columbia University as its backdrop. So we get sort of the best of both worlds. And here I get to focus on how to advance women, um, especially in math and science, um, and how to ensure that everyone's reaching their potential and not choking under pressure if we can help it. So if you're like school I'm associated with or, or a lot of others this spring, 
we did a lot of what I like to call emergency remote teaching via Zoom. So what <laughs> happened this spring at your institution and how have you evolved since, since then in terms of uh, how, you're, how you're teaching? Yeah, I mean, we were, Barnard is in the middle of New York City. Um, and so we were really, New York City, as you know, was the epicenter of the pandemic. Um, we were hit very hard. And like most institutions across the country, we went remote. Um, in a pretty quick amount of time. Um, and I think, you know, our faculty did an amazing job being flexible, but it certainly wasn't um, ideal for anyone. Um, so we sent our students home, um, we transitioned to Zoom classes. And what we really learned and what we heard from students, we assessed how we did. Um, some things were good, some things were not so good. Um, what we really learned over the summer was that students wanted to have classes that were addressing the here and now, uh, whether it was issues around racial justice, issues around the pandemic and how it's laid bare economic and um, all sorts of inequality around health um, care. Uh, and so we spent the summer, our faculty really did an amazing lift, really refocusing a lot of the curriculum. So we went to a three semester model for this year along with Columbia. So students can now take fall, spring and summer semester. And we split our semesters each into A and B, where students can now take intense courses over six or seven weeks, fall A, fall B, spring A, spring B. And about a third of our classes were um, refocused into this um, smaller intense semester. And most of them were revamped to focus on the current time. Um, so we have a computer scientist teaching about privacy and um, issues around contact tracing and testing. Um, and we also have um, a new class that all first year students enrolled in called Big Problems 2020, where we actually had speakers that we never would have been able to have on campus on such short notice. And students are really addressing issues around healthcare and activism, um, and hopefully thinking about how they employ some of what they're learning in their own lives. It's 100% online. I mean, yeah, 100% remote now. We are remote. Um, we do have part of campus open for students who are in the area, um, but all of the classes are online right now. Now, how much is, how much are your classes uh, synchronous as opposed to asynchronous? Um, it really depends on the class. So all of our professors are working with their individual courses, um, depending on where students are. So much of it is synchronous, but certainly if we have a science class or a humanities class where you have a considerable international population in the class, some of it might be synchronous and some asynchronous to account for time differences. But most of Barnard classes, students at Barnard um, take classes at Barnard and Columbia and vice versa, they're all cross-listed. And so students can choose between smaller Barnard seminars with five, seven, eight, ten 10 people in a class to larger lectures at Columbia. Um, so it's really, the best of both worlds in that way. How have uh, students adapted to this uh, compressed uh, time frame for their terms? So they, well, you, you tell me what, <laughs> what's happening um, with that. So students are taking some semester, they're still semester long classes, but about a third of them have gone into these intense um, and peer, smaller intense classes. And part of that was sparked by pedagogy research showing that for virtual environments, shorter intense periods of class can be beneficial for learning. Um, and I think, you know, students are working hard. I mean, that's always the case at a place like Barnard, um, but they're really loving the classes that are focused on the current moment. Now, students must be anxious. I know I'm anxious. <laughs> I'm anxious. I'm anxious uh, <laughs> not only uh, about the politics, the pandemic, and uh, I just personally just went through moving a house after 24 years. So um, we're still unpacking boxes, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so how do students um, handle their stress and their anxiety? And what, what has your school done to, to help them manage that? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think there's, first of all, I think it's really important to call it out for what it is. It's okay to feel uncomfortable and anxious during this time. Um, and part of what I know as a psychologist and what we have heard is that we know that having context can be really helpful. 
understanding how this particular point in time fits within a larger time frame, understanding that there will be an end, understanding that going back to the old normal in terms of racial and economic equality, inequality is not the right move, that we should be pushing forward to a new normal is really important. And so one thing that we've focused a lot on is changing the, the class structure and, and the courses to give students that context. Now it's just one piece of the puzzle, but I think it's a really important one. Being able for students to understand that pandemics have happened before, that disruptions have happened before, that there are things that come out of challenges that can be real opportunities can be an anxiety reducer in itself. Of course, we also have um, are making uh, all of our um, counseling appointments available online. We're helping students find support in their own area. Um, and one thing that we've done that I've really been proud of is that we have stood up alumni circles with our alumni around the world in local communities. So we have done about, we have about 30 of them across the world where students and alums in particular areas are meeting each other, socially distanced and safe, but also providing that local context. And I think there's really something powerful about being able to have some meaning making out of what's going on. Um, that sense of control, we know that not having a sense of control is one of the biggest anxiety producers. Um, and in my own research, when we study, for example, people who worry about math and we look inside their brains, we see it's not when they're doing math that they're most worried, it's when they're worried about what's gonna happen, about the math that's upcoming, the what ifs. Um, so I'm trying to use a little bit of that research to translate into what we're doing in our own classrooms. Oh, that's, that's pretty exciting. Uh, I have a biology and a pharmacology background myself. So that, uh, that piques my interest. Um, you know, I think um, so much, uh, there's been so much written now, of course, even before the pandemic about how you combat stress. And a lot of it has, might have to do with sleep, exercise, uh, what you eat. Is that, are those the topics that you address and how, how do you address them? Yeah, so last year we started a whole new health and wellness campaign called Feel Well, Do Well. And the idea really was twofold. One, that being successful in the classroom, in order to be successful in the classroom, you have to think about your health and wellness outside the classroom. So that has everything to do with sleep, eating, eating well, exercise, holistic wellness, food, um, all very important. And the second is that Students health and wellness is the entire campus's responsibility. It's not just the purview of the health center or the counseling services. The front line are oftentimes dining workers, access attendants, faculty in classes. So one of the things we actually did last year was just train faculty and staff to notice signs of student distress. Um, and that's even more important. We're relying on faculty and we spent a lot of time providing workshops this summer with faculty on Zoom to notice signs of that distress. Um, and I can't, I can't stress enough that we have to focus on the whole individual here. And so I'm really excited about what we're doing in this area. And it goes beyond just the mental and physical. We talk a lot about financial wellness, um, especially for women, understanding your finances, understanding what it means to do taxes, understanding um, budgets is something that oftentimes is not in, with traditional gender roles relegated into our court. And it's so important that we're equipping our students not just to be powerful minds in an academic or work setting, but to be powerful in the choices they're making for life. It matters when you start saving for retirement, for example. And that has everything to do with health and wellness. That is so important. And, and I think that get, gets missed so, mu so much. You know, it's just some practical you know, advice and training on, on, on how, to, how to live your life and how to, how to manage this increasing technological world that we live in. Um, yeah, I mean, we, um, we've, for the last few years have done financial literacy workshops for seniors. And the one thing they say, you could go to one table to learn about taxes, another about budgeting, another about how you think about retirement or choosing your health benefits in your first job. And the one thing they've said to us repeatedly is this, we should have this for first years. It should happen at day one. And it's so interesting because it doesn't fall across economic lines. You might think that just students who come from the lowest income backgrounds would need support and help in this area, but students who come from the most privileged backgrounds have no idea how to do their taxes. They have no idea what it means to pick retirement benefits. 
And we know that um, women are empowered when they are empowered to take care of themselves. And so I consider this to be a really important aspect of what we're doing. Yeah, that's, that's so important. Uh, you know, being, being a scientist, uh, um, you're probably in a good position to, to comment on what's been called Zoom fatigue. I mean, <laughs> how many hours do students spend on Zoom in any given session? I know uh, my podcast, I'd like to keep them around 20 minutes because I have people, they, they, their mind wanders and, uh, you know, they, they might uh, switch, switch it off or rather listen to music. So what, what can you tell us about your view on Zoom fatigue? Well, I mean, I'm just going from an N of one myself, but it's real. Um, and I think, you know, I actually sat down, I meet with all of my senior vice presidents once a week, and I used my meeting last week to talk about how we could help manage our own teams in this time of rapid change, right? Because that's exhausting. Rapid change is exhausting. And we go through these fits and spurts of, you know, dealing with the pandemic last March when no one knew anything, to getting ready for the fall, to getting ready for the spring. Um, and it's just this constant being, you know, in this, this state of go, go, go. And whether you're on Zoom or not, that's exhausting. So one thing that I did just a couple of weeks ago is I cut all my meetings that were an hour to 45 minutes. And I cut all my meetings that were 45 minutes to half an hour. Um, and it turns out that's okay and you can do it. <laughs> um, and I've also started to be really articulate about deadlines. So what's, what do you need now and what can you wait for? Um, you know, oftentimes I, I'll ask for something for my team and I never thought about, you know, saying I don't need this right, right this second. And I've been much more, I've been trying to be clearer about that because in this age of everything's an emergency, we're doing everything for the first time giving people permission to put something on a back burner is a huge reduction in stress. Absolutely. And finally, yep. we, we did something last week for our faculty and staff, which was really inspired by the faculty and I'm really proud of it. You know, we sort of looked under our own noses for how we could help take some of the demand off of faculty and staff who have kids who are at home, um, faculty who are trying to teach under non-optimal conditions. So we, um, we upheld, we, we, we stood up a Barnard Tudor Corps. So we asked many of our students who normally would have a campus job or who would be on a work study, study scholarship um, and, in, and, to, and we asked them to volunteer as tutors um, to work with faculty and staff children over Zoom. Um, so we're paying these students, the college is paying them as a tutor corps, we're giving them training. Um, and it can be everything, anything from, you know, reading or playing a game with a four-year-old to helping a 16-year-old with math. Uh, but what it's done is it's given parents permission, our faculty and staff who are parents, to have a little time for themselves. And it was a resource that was right under our nose. And, you know, it was a financial um, cost for us, but not a huge one. Um, and I'm really excited about thinking about how we can reimagine some of the, the things we have around us to do more of this. And I think it's also been great from what I've heard for the students, they're getting to interact with faculty in a way they never would before, sort of in their homes, so to speak. That's very innovative. That is really great. How about the student? In fact, you, you anticipated my question because we talked a lot about students, but faculty you, you've addressed already. I mean, it's a terrible stress. I can imagine some uh, some of my staff that that work from home and they have three kids, and you know, uh, it's it's just really, really, really tough. You know, uh, the other thought that comes to mind is about um, I'm a technologist, uh, mm -hmm. in addition to my uh, academic uh, uh, training area. So um, I'm wondering. Um, if you're relying uh, more on other technologies, not just Zoom now, uh, I was curious, you know, what learning management system you use? Uh, have you, um, are you ending up using that more than in the past? And how's that worked? Yeah, so we um, use Canvas, um, we use Zoom. The other thing that we have done, you know, it's interesting, it's technology, but not, I guess this goes under the spirit of activating our own students. We, um, offered many students jobs as preceptors to just 
be an aid to a faculty member in class, for example, organizing all the comments coming in on Zoom chat. Um, we know that it's hard to do two things at once. Like it's very hard to give a talk and to read the Zoom comments. Um, and so having someone who can organize them, deal with repeated comments, then sort of lob a question out to a faculty member has been really helpful. So I think about it as sort of enhancing the, the, the technology with humans. Um, and it's been great, you know, for the students, uh, upper class students to be able to, to be an aide in a class this way. It's been great for the faculty. Um, and I think, you know, we've learned that technology has its limits. I mean, this is, you know, there are some things that are really amazing about being able to zoom in a speaker from across the world that you wouldn't be able to get. Um, but humans, this is why you can't drive and talk on a cell phone. We can't do two things at once. Um, and so figuring out what the aids are to help faculty be most effective, um, I think has been imp important. And we started that because in our all campus faculty meetings, it was got so hard to read all the comments and chat and talk. And so we learned from that and then we put it into place in the classrooms. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. You know, I was um, thinking about um, what you're doing and, and it occurred to me, uh, I know, um, most of your students came there because they probably want a campus experience. They want that face-to-face -face contact. Um, I was curious how many online courses or programs you've had before the pandemic came or is this really new territory for you? Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of it is new territory for us. We did, um, we have done some obviously connections with alum courses online, pre-college, um, but this is in terms of really um, standing up uh, the ability to teach in this way um, is really a new endeavor for us. And so we focused a lot on the technology, but I think what we do best is the content. And that's really where we put our expertise and our faculty who are at Barnard because they love the students are also tenured at Columbia. They're amazing scholars and teachers. And I think, you know, you can help anyone use Zoom, but to change the content, to teach a class about women's health in the pandemic right now from the vantage point of what has happened in history and what's happening now. I mean, that's something that will stick with students forever. Very good, yeah. I, I can imagine how, how uh, impactful that must be. It's, it's, uh, it's a great way to move forward. And, you know, uh, I hate the term new normal. You know, I, I like to think that someday we're gonna return to the old normal, maybe uh, we should say it's a, you know, a temporary um, sidetrack here with the pandemic, but what, and this, this I think will be my last question because I, I do want to be respectful of your time. Um, I too. think I'll pick it, my uh, nine-year-old up. That's my heart uh, up. So I'm, I'm, I'm parenting Zooming at the same time. Uh, <laughs> okay. Yeah, I just want to ask, um, what do you think the, the new normal will be? How, how will it inform you going forward, assuming, you know, uh, you know, hopefully, you know, six months to a year from now, we'll have a vaccine and we'll start to drift back into a more normal way of, of teaching and learning. How do you think uh, this experience will change the way you uh, go forward? Yeah, well, first of all, I think it's okay if we don't go back to a normal because I think that normal had a lot of problems that our young people are seeing and systemic problems around inequality, um, around access. So I think it's okay to push back in that way. Um, at a place like Barnard where uh, the experience in the classroom in the city on campus is so important, I certainly don't see an online education replacing that. But what I do see and where I think there's so many exciting opportunities for change is that it allows these, some of these online components or virtual components can allow us to reach so many more people, maybe through our pre-college programs that allow young women who are in junior high and high school to experience what a Barnard education is about. Maybe through connecting with women across the world who want to know just in time information about fights around reproductive rights or healthcare um, or economics or what's the latest in science. I just think there's such an opportunity to think creatively now um, and to think about how technology is woven into what we do. And um, I'm excited to do that. That's a great response. I like that. In fact, uh, 
Listen, I, I want to thank you again so much for uh, speaking with uh, me and my audience today. And and uh, one takeaway for me is that I'm going to cut my meetings down. I love that. <laughs> Our meetings to 45 and, and 45. It times. works. It really yeah. works. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Again, thank you so much. I, I really yeah. appreciate your time. And, no and problem. It was great to wishes. chat. I hope you enjoyed the interview. It was very interesting to me to find out how a prestigious school like Barnard College handled this pandemic. So stay tuned for the full song, Maybe I'm Amazed, by Blake Morgan. Until next time, have a great week. it for today's episode thank you very much for listening don't forget to give rod feedback 
You can leave comments on his blog or send email to rod at rodspulsepodcast.com. The preceding audio commentary is the product of the author, Dr. Rodney Murray, and does not represent the official viewpoint of the University of the Sciences or any other institution or company. Yes.